My 10th graders, I'll just quiz you later. But well, yeah. I took this last year. Okay. Oh, no. Well then, Grace, I'm sorry. So everybody's gonna moderate. She's already given out the rules. Matt, I'll get you permission to live on my way out. Just take a seat. And then it will be filmed, but you guys are not going to be in it. Okay. Darn. start? Yes. All right. So I think we should start by each candidate saying their name, and then we can go from there, right? So I'm Alex Grossmo. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. I am Eric Garcia, and I have the honor to serve as your student member for it. Hi, everyone. My name is Liam Flynn from Wheaton High School, and I'm here to lunch today. All right, so I'll start from left to right. So, Alex, uh, question number one. Give us your platform for your campaign, and why should we vote for you? You have 30 seconds. So, my campaign is all about the student's voice and getting action done in MCPS. I want to make some changes in MCPS, and I want to get a fresh voice in, at the Board of Education, representing the students at the board, not the board, to the students. All right. Eric, same question. All right. Well, I just wanted to start off by thanking all of you for being here. You know, Clarksburg really represents a lot of what Montgomery County is about. We have rich diversity, a great student government, students participating in the Minority Scholars Program, but then again, we also have vast overcrowding. We've seen, we, you guys just got a new addition this year, and here we have a row of 11 portables. And I'm running for another term as small because as our student body, you guys deserve continuity and you deserve action. Someone who knows the people, knows the process, and knows how to get things done for you. This year we've elevated the student voice, and I don't think that this is a campaign that I'm running, but it's a continued wave of momentum for our student body. Once again, thank you for having me today, and I'm excited to be here. The main platform that I'm running on today is communication between the SMOB and students. For far too long, for almost the past 30 SMOBs, there's been very little between what the SMOB is doing and how that's actually impacting the students. The main cornerstone of my platform is launching a website called Mo Connect. With this website, it'd be an informational hub for every student to be able to look at what their SGA is doing, what other schools' SGAs are doing, up to and including MCR, MCJC, and the SMOB. That way, the students know what the Board of Ed is actually doing for them, and the students can have their voice and their impact actually make a difference. All right, moving on to question two. So, Alex, like, I know you have a lot of great points, but how will you implement your views on the issue that you stand for? All right, so I'm a man of action, not just saying words. I mean what I say, and at my school, I've been able to get a lot of things done. I've been able to give food trucks to the students. I've created a student advocacy group with over 200 members that have been fighting for the student voice for the past several months. I've gotten a lot of things done, and I know the pathways to make to take us into the future, and I'll continue doing that as your next month. So, specifically, how will you implement it? So, I will advocate at the student board. I will connect with the students through advocacy um, with MCR and the local SJs. I will take things local because I don't believe we can have the same approach for every single school. We need to take it to the individual school presidents, we need to take it to the individual school SGAs, and we need to ask them what they believe the problems are, not just have a top down approach where the SMOB dictates down to students. Eric, same question. Well, it's important to understand what the SMOB really is. So the student member of the board is one of eight board members. So to get something passed, what you really need is five votes on the Board of Education. And this year, I'm proud of the relationships that I've built with my colleagues on the board, and also of the administration of MCPS, who communicates with local schools, with the principals, and really, that's where the work happens behind the scenes. Now. Year after year, and this, I know that this is the next question, you've heard SMOBs talk about what they're gonna do, talk about um, their promises, but to really implement your ideas, you have to have a strong student voice at the board table, and we need to unify our student body to bring not just one student at the board table, but to really bring all 156,000 students to the board table. I'm proud of the progress that we made, and I wanna continue making that progress, so thank you. Well, moving, again, the main cornerstone platform, Mo Connect, is something that my team and I are already working to create. And the important part about Mo Connect is that it's not just for myself. Even if you guys do not vote for me, and I do not win and do not make a convention, I'm still going to work to implement this platform for the small to use because I believe in making change, whether or not I have the power to do so. However, with the power of the small, I'm very good at networking, and I hope to be able to create a relation with the Board of Education. That way, they can understand that what I say isn't just the weight of what I think the students want, but has the full weight of MCPS behind it. All right, so Alex, so like over the past years, we have seen many false promises made in order to ensure our votes, and that has really hurt the county and a lot of our opinions. So how do you plan on keeping your promises when others have not? 
So I think that uh, my record speaks for itself, and as I was campaigning um, for one of my schools in Whitman, I actually helped them to start their own food truck program, and they're going to be implementing that over the uh, next several months. So my promises are concrete, and they're based off the actions that I've already done to further student voice, to further more options of lunch, and to create new diversity and student voice at every school in MCPS. Um, I believe that keeping promises and being trustworthy will actually greatly increase the integrity of the office, and I hope to continue that and continue the integrity that I have pa had in the past as class president and as serving my time on MCR. Thanks for the question. I think it's important when you look at your small candidates this year to listen to somebody who's not just someone who talks about change, but has actually gotten this change accomplished for you and your peers. And you see the impacts in your schools. You know, last year I talked about the field inequities, where in some schools, like in Kennedy High School, you have these big puddles in the field, and that we should look at getting turf fields in schools. And this year we secured turf funding, turf field funding for every single high school. I talked about the need to make computer science a graduation technology credit, and we've made this computer science a technology graduation credit. And I also talked about the need to reduce testing, and I'm proud of the steps that we've taken to reduce testing this year. Again, we've made a lot of progress, and we need to continue to look for somebody on the board who doesn't just talk about change, but has a proven record of getting things accomplished for you and your peers to make your school life better every single day. Yeah. Well, in the past year, I was elected as the student government president for my SG at Wheaton High School, and in that time, we've created a lot of sweeping changes that have helped out, considering that Wheaton High School is now the newest facility in Montgomery County, along with the addition of STEM on the third floor, which is full math, science, biomedical, engineering base. The main point that I'm trying to get across today is that I'm going to work for you. So I'm not here to make those false promises, and through MoConnect, you guys will be able to stay accountable to what I'm actually doing. By live streaming and live tweeting everything that's going on so you know what the topic is for you, you can't say that you didn't know, and I wanna make sure that you will never have to say, I don't know what this mob is doing. By having you guys stay accountable to me, it keeps me accountable to you. Thank you. All right, guys, so uh, back to Alex. What is your stance uh, on equity, and how would you um, define it? I would de define equity as every single student in this county having an opportunity to succeed. And right now, unfortunately, some students do not have such an opportunity as compared to others. I want to increase funding to the schools that need it most, not just give to the schools who have been achieving great on tests. Because tests are not the best way to measure the, the funding that is necessary to continue a great education. I want to help the students at every school locally, so I will enable SG officers at their schools through passing reforms in MCPS to give them more power and to make SJ a more a bigger part of student life and to let them actually solve the problems that are at every school because I cannot possibly know what happens at these schools on a daily basis. Therefore, we should enable them to make this, the schools more equitable at their local level. Eric, same question. So as your student member of the board this year, I have been proud to champion equity at the board table. And equity is different than equality. Equality means the same for every student. Equity means allocating resources to the schools that need it most. So that means if you have more students living in poverty, those students need more resources. If you have ESOL students who need those services, then we allocate those services. Equity is all about closing the achievement gap. So every student, regardless of their background, regardless of what they look like, has an equal chance to succeed in Montgomery County. We have a lot of work to do to get there, but every single discussion that we've had at the board table, I've brought it back yeah. to equity for the students. Again, I'm a huge advocate for equity and excellence, and that's how we're gonna take our school system back to the top. Well, they have the same question. All right. Something that I'm doing that the other candidates aren't is I'm working with the NEA on a project called Eradicating the School to Prison Pipeline. What's the NEA? Um, the NEA is the National Education Administration, and closing the prison, uh, school to prison pipeline is one of the biggest groups that they have. In three weeks, I'm going to be going on a live web stream in order to talk about this problem from the student's perspective. I believe that in order to champion equity, we have to work on closing that achievement gap. And we can't do it with other policies such as just bringing in device or trying to get more people into a better position. We need to do it by changing the mentality of the students to believe that they can be equal, they can be equal to all the other students, they can succeed, and no matter what, that they can do what they set out to do what they want to do. So that's how I'm going to champion equity. Okay, so Alex, so how are you going to ensure that us students get what we need? And the second part to that question is, uh, relating to Clarksburg High School, what would you do for students within Clarksburg High School? So as I was walking in Clarksburg High School, I'm going to start with the second part. Um, 
I saw that it was really well maintained, although I was told that it's not a new building. And that just shows that it has a great spirit and it has a lot of people who care about the building and the facility. And I want to increase students' excitement and students' caring about their schools and their education. And by doing that, by doing so, I think that we can get a lot of things accomplished together on the board. I've been able to do a lot of stuff, um, a lot of stuff at RM, um, food trucks, I've been able to get students' voices heard through the advocacy group, and I've been able to pass meaningful campaign reform to get the students involved in SGA. And by getting students involved, and by getting students to care about actual what MCR does and what SMOB does, then, only then, can we actually accomplish something as a board. Excellent question. So, Alex had alluded to Clarksburg High School, and again, I would, this is a school that has a lot of pride in, in what you guys do, and it's important to understand every single issue that you guys have, whether it's big, whether it's small, and what I've done is your small is centered all the discussions that the board's having around the students, because too often there's a divorce between what's happening in the classroom and what's happening at the higher levels, and those, bringing those discussions of the students' needs, the students' wants, the students' desires, your desires, back to the board table is what I've done as your small. There's a few ways that I've um, ensured that the students have gotten what they need. So when every issue has come out, for example, grading, what I've done is I've gone out to schools and I've held focus groups with students to hear their actual voices in addition to having online polls, whether it's through social media, whether it's on my new website, smoveric.com, to ensure that the students' voices are aligning with the decision-making processes. Now, all, all too often, that's not the case at the board table, that students' voices are not aligning with the decision-making. It's gotten better this year, but we still need to continue to ground home that we are the largest stakeholder in Montgomery County and that our voices need to be heard above all. So to more to ensure, going uh, again, starting out with Clarksburg, to ensure that students get what they need. As Eric had said earlier, but the important part is that this school has a lot of portables, which really represents that overcrowding that we have here at Clarksburg and around the school. Uh, and throughout Montgomery County, there's overcrowding, and new school buildings are going to be needed. So in order to ensure that students can get what they need, we need students to work to get that. An analogy that was created was usually when your car breaks down and people are driving past the highway, now people stop to help you. But if you get out of that car and you start pushing it, many people will stop to help you. The students, once we start working towards what we want to do, and we can show that the student body and the students of Montgomery County actually want to get this done, I believe we can get the Board of Education to completely support that. Okay, moving on. So we, so we talked a lot about students, but now I want to focus our attention on teachers. So, uh, Alex, how, how do you ensure that teachers are preparing students for college? Uh, educationally and socially. So, uh, I was just going to ask, Emily, did you need to go in order or did you need to? No, we're not going in order. Okay, I'm just going to make well. sure. Um, so, can you repeat the question again? Sure. So, uh, we're changing on to, the, to teachers now. So, how do you ensure that teachers are preparing students for college, educationally and socially? Well, socially, I think that the students prepare themselves for college really well. Um, mostly, I think that the students who care about college will be able to find new friends in college, find new connections, and it will be very accessible to them. Now, in terms of teachers, I think that teaching to the test is by no means the proper way to get people into college. Teaching to the test is what we've seen a lot, and I think that if my policy has always been, if a whole class fails a test, I do not believe that every single student did not study for that test. I believe there's a problem at the educational level of the teacher's fault. I think that if every single student in the class did poorly on the test, or if every single student in the class does not know certain material, that is not their fault. It is actually the teacher's responsibility to fix. And by allocating proper funding to teacher certifications, by getting teachers to do what they do best, and getting them in the subjects that they are professionally inclined to do, we can make sure the teachers are teaching not to the test, but to the students' needs individually. So what would happen to these bad teachers? Would they, would, would you, do you think the adults in the Board of Education would, what would, what would be the outcome of that? The outcome would be uh, several steps. First, it should, the test that is in question, if students complain, it should be appealed to the administration and should be reviewed. If it is reviewed and is found that it is because of improper instruction, there should be either a curve implemented or an excuse for the test to be retaken at a later date when it is actually properly taught. This, I understand that there are certain time constraints in the curriculum, but if we do not stop to lay the foundation, the house will become shaky, and we cannot let our education be on a, set on a poor foundation. If our education is set on a poor foundation, then students will not be prepared for college, and we need to make sure that people know what they're doing in school. Excellent question. So Alex had 
just briefly alluded to the foundation, let me touch on something which is the most important education benchmark throughout our educational history, which is third grade reading and third grade literacy. Far too many of our younger siblings, our peers at our elementary level, are not reading on grade level. And if you're not reading on grade level by third grade, the educational trajectory means that you're probably not gonna be reading on grade level for the rest of your education career. That's why this year I've fought to secure a $1.4 million partnership so that students who aren't reading, reading on grade level can catch up during the summer through an enrichment course that not only focuses on reading but also on the social aspects. Now when we get to high school, we know that not all students are gonna to go to college. College is not for everybody. That's why this year I've reinvigorated our focus around career readiness to enhance the offering so that students can choose a variety of pathways out of high school if they're not going to college so that all of us can be successful in whatever pathway that we choose. Now for college specifically, I want to continue to increase the number of SAT and ACT prep courses that we're offering here in high schools and also offer those for free after school and over the summer because we don't always have time to fit those into our daily school schedules. Now we also need to continue to have college representatives come in, partner with minority scholars programs so that students who might not be thinking about college get on that pathway towards going to college. Yeah. Uh, one main point that I want to bring up is that I'm also working with clubs and the important part about getting ready for college socially is that many people who go to college aren't just going to go there, go to each of their lectures, go home and do their work. They're going to participate in other activities. As we know, many colleges around um, the United States really have hundreds and hundreds of clubs either created by teachers at the colleges or by universities or by the students themselves. So what I really want to work with is having teachers, more teachers be available, that way more clubs that students want can get made because that's what's really going to help out. For at least on the educational purposes, I'm working on helping out by creating more elective classes available in schools. That way, even if your school is smaller, we can find a way to get you those great electives, such as Blair, where they have marine biology and entomology. And at Wheaton, you can hope to get maybe a semester of law and a semester of econ. But for students who really want to excel, who really want to get involved in their college career, I feel like it's important that we need to work with those teachers to create elective programs. That way, every student can get access to the classes that they want to take. All right. So, uh, the next question is: um, Do you think that? Oh, not bad. Do you think ISS is an appropriate consequence for students leaving school for a decent meal? Um, Actually, your question. Yeah. No, of course not. ISS is not an acceptable um, punishment for open lunch. I think that open lunch should be implemented at every school where it is possible. Not only have I had experience with this, but this is an issue I've been concerning my, myself with over the past year. As class president, I got food trucks at our end. That is a big accomplishment. Because so far, we have been told as SGA that we cannot do this, we cannot do that. But if we think outside the box, then we can have an actual solution for the problems that we need. If we think creatively, then we can get the food trucks to come to us and not have students crossing dangerous roads to go out to lunch. If we just change certain uh, aspects of the zoning laws and remove the cafeteria competition caps, then we'll be able to get every student a, a lunch that is available. And I understand the concern there are there is with students um, who need reduced or free meals. And for that, I would just like to say, for them, it is unacceptable the quality of food we are serving them. We are only as good as the things we do to help the people most in need. And if we're serving them the quality of the food that is being served right now, then it's completely unacceptable, and we need to have severe, several reforms to do with school lunches, especially with nutrition, pricing, and the ability of students to enjoy their meals. So if a student, uh goes out to get a decent meal and they get injured, then is it the school's fault or is it the student's fault? Who's hold accountable if something like that happens? Well, if the student goes out and um, there is an open lunch policy at the school, do you, you mean by that? Or yes. If, if there's an open lunch policy, I think that there should be a waiver signed. And a way, the waiver should be signed by the student and the parents saying, look, we can go out to open lunch and this is our choice to go out to open lunch. Um, if the waiver is signed, then, of course, then it is the student's responsibility. So open lunch is something that I've been passionately fighting for for many years now as well. This year I want to bring together principals from schools throughout the county to create a coalition so that we can get open lunch, again, in every school that it's possible. And there's some schools that have been waiting way too long, whether it's at Gaithersburg High School where they were just building in addition to their school, and then what actually happened is that while they were building, they took away open lunch and never gave it back to them. And here at Clarksburg, just about you know a mile or two down the road, there's plenty of restaurants where you guys should be able to go while walking might not be feasible, perhaps start by opening it up 
with seniors and juniors going out who can drive. And it's important to have a sign of mutual respect between the administration and students. And too often that's lacking in our schools, that, that sign of respect. And if that sign of respect is, is implemented, then I believe that we can truly get open lunch at every school. Now, in-school suspension, again, should never be a, an acceptable um, punishment for students going off campus. And actually, after this meeting today, I'm gonna to be talking to some folks now that I've heard that concern to bring it to um, the administration here and also to the boss of the administration because that should never be happening to any student. All right, well, in-school suspension, um, like many of the other candidates here, I believe that it's not an acceptable consequence for students who just wanna go out and get something to eat. I go to Wheaton High School, and 90% of the students at Wheaton High School are on free and reduced lunch meal programs because it's a very poor area. And students who want to go out to get decent meals that they can't normally afford can't do that because we have Connecticut Avenue, which is a huge six-lane highway right there that prevents students from going to places such as Aspen Hill. On contrary, there are schools that have open lunch, such as Walter Johnson, because they're a simple walk away from a huge shopping center. So I believe that while we should be fighting for open lunch, we also have to care about the security of the students as well. Even though I don't believe that ISS is an appropriate way to discipline the students, I feel like something must be done to ensure that freshmen and sophomores who are more reckless don't go out and get injured because they're trying to get meals. However, juniors and seniors who have those cars and have those abilities, I believe they should also be allowed to go out and get open lunch. But it's something that we have to think about, not only from the standpoint of a decent meal, but we also want to concern about the safety of the students. We don't want to have students injured just because of this. All right, guys, uh, second to last question is, um, how are you going to deal with the $100 million deficit that we have within our county? So, uh, um, so as I've heard before, and as many of you probably heard, the SMOB Voting Rights Bill is currently in the county commission and will be soon sent on to the proper channels. Hopefully it gets passed. I'm hoping this wholeheartedly, and then we'll actually have a student voice at the board talking about the budget. That's the first part. And how to deal with that. I'm not gonna keep myself constrained to Montgomery County. I'm going to go to Annapolis, I'm gonna lobby the governor, and I'm going to make sure that at least the students are able to voice their concerns with this. And I'm not gonna just pass policies for the students while we have a huge deficit. We need to find ways that we can, uh, where we can pass smart budget plans. Smart budget plans, like maybe not spending uh, not starting out new programs to renew uh, sports centers while the school hallways are crumbling and the bathrooms are in disarray. So we need to balance the budget and found it, find a way to make smart policy, not just money policies. Thanks, so I would just like to uh, point out that Alex said that it's in the county commission, the small voting rights bill, so that's actually incorrect. It was just in the House Ways and Means Committee last week and I went up and testified in front of the state legislature and I'm proud to have strong relationships with our state delegation. Um, and that's where we're gonna get the funding is from the state level and also at the county level. Just by a show of hands, how many students here have problems accessing their counselors when they need a schedule change or when they're having issues? Yeah, exactly. So just last week when the board voted on, um, on, the, on the proposed $2.5 billion budget, what I did was I voted for, an, I supported an amendment that would increase the number of counselors in our schools because that is critical to get students the supports that they need to thrive um, in their classrooms every single day. And it's also important that when we're talking about numbers, we throw out these huge numbers, these $2.5 billion, $3 billion. But as I was focusing at the board table, these numbers have a story. These numbers are about people, they're about students, they're about enhancing our classroom experience every single day. And um, you know, we said I might not have a vote, but I was very active in our budget deliberations last week. And after I spoke, Mr. Durso, who's our board president, said, Eric, you might not have a vote, but you certainly have a voice and we're listening to you just like all of our other colleagues. So thank you. All right. So the $100 million deficit, again, that is a very big number. But I feel like in order to make these changes, the county has to hear that the students need this money. Overcrowding is a big problem at many schools. That's because we simply don't have the funding to get Clarksburg, who has 11 portables, a brand new school building. Even though the school is only 10 years old, obviously it can't handle the amount of influx of students. And other schools around, Wheaton just got a new school building because we're overcrowded. Can you imagine having to do two pep rallies because you can't fit everyone in the school into one building? Can you imagine the problems with that? So, while we need to spend more money in order to make sure the students get the quality of education we need, we also need to show the students that they can work to lobby themselves too in order to get more funding from the county and the state levels. That's a big point on the low connect. That way students will be able to know, hey, at this time right here, there's a hearing at the board. Maybe I want to go testify at that. 
That way every student gets the opportunity to make their voice heard instead of just, oh, this mom's gonna do it, I guess he's the only one who can. So can I just make a quick point of clarification? So we've been talking about buildings and the buildings here and some of the fields and stuff. So there's actually two budgets in Montgomery County. One of them talks about works with a physical building, so that's our brick and mortar, and the other works on teachers. So the $100 million deficit we're talking about is getting people in the classrooms, reducing class size, and expanding Chromebooks and minority scholars program. All right, thank you, gentlemen, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.